Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the Storytelling Setbacks panel here as part of uh, Ludo Naricon. We're going to be talking about something that um, doesn't happen very often in game development, which is a game not going the way that you expected it to go. Um, that's a joke. Games, game development uh, always has a lot of uh, challenges and twisting paths. So we're going to be talking about, particularly from a narrative angle, how we um, navigate those those problems. Um, we have a really awesome panel here today. So um, why don't we start with some introductions? Patrick? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm Patrick uh, Ewing. Uh, you may know me as Hoverbird on Twitter. Uh, I'm the uh, creative director of uh, Chance Agency. We make Neocab, um, uh, which is out now. And uh, I love narrative design. I uh, do a little bit of writing, but I'd say I focus more on game design and narrative design. Um, and before Neocab, I worked on Firewatch. And yeah, I'm so excited to be here. Cool. Avi, do you want to go next? We can't hear you. <laughs> we cannot, yeah, sorry. Uh, I'll pop in while you yeah, sure. working on mic stuff. Uh, my name is Becca Saltzman. Um, I am sort of the CEO and co-founder of Finji. Um, and yeah, we're an independent developer and sort of an indie publisher. So we released um, Overland last year. That's one of our um, internal projects. That's the game that we made, like our studio made. And then we've also published um, Night in the Woods back in 2017, um, Wilmot's Warehouse last year. And then we've also got Tunic and Chicory coming in the future. Um, and my work, weirdly, um, aside from running Finji with Adam, um, I do a lot of the, especially on Overlands, a lot of the narrative design work that happened on Overland. Um, Adam and I worked on that together, um, which is all this like sort of weird procedurally built system that's in like, I don't know, 18 languages or something. So it's a bit of a challenge uh, and kind of a, uh, difficult to make. Sounds good. Can I give it another shot? Yes, we can hear you now. Yay, it's so good. I think it was because I tried to mute myself and it temporarily muted everyone and then destroyed my microphone, which is <laughs> a very useful feature. Actually. Sounds good. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm ABB, uh, she, her pronouns, and I am the uh, writer and director of Heaven Will Be Mine and We Know the Devil, which, um, or indie queer visual novels. Um, I'm now working on uh, narrative design. I'm script writing consultation for another uh, unannounced indie project that somebody else is um, creating um, at the moment. But yeah, so I mostly, I, I'm, a, I'm a writer by trade. I actually uh, have an MFA in creative writing. So I'm really one of the more writing focused people here maybe, but I also um, have like, um, I've also like working on the director of our project, I've been doing a lot of high level narrative design stuff, which involves a lot of different kinds of writing, um, which kinds of writing that I never thought I would be doing when I was in grad school. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and I'm Matthew. Uh, I work with Zachtronics right now. Um, I write all the, the stories and do the narrative design for Zachtronics games, um, as well as the, the music and sound. And I also created uh, Eliza, a visual novel about AI and technology that's um, in the festival, the Ludo Naricon Festival this year. You can check it out. There's a live stream where I am talking over my own writing in the game uh, and explaining it. So I think that uh, that brings us to uh, an interesting point, which is that writing challenges in games kind of come from two different areas. One is the writing itself is not good enough or, or people give feedback that, uh, that, that the writing itself or the story needs to change. And then there's times when the game design itself changes based on feedback and the game changes and then the writing needs to be changed in order to reflect that new direction that the game is going in. Um, I think that probably we all have interesting stories about uh, times when stories needed to be sort of drastically changed in order to uh, work with a new direction that a game was taking. I can talk a little bit about Overland. Um, our development time in Overland was 
uh, five years or something. So over the course of five years, obviously the direction changed a little bit. Uh, the tech, the look, um, the direction, um, it all started out as sort of like this turn-based uh, strategy or sort of um, puzzle game, heist game, something like that. Um, but the um, narrative direction of it actually um, had to morph quite a bit as we went along um, because we wanted people to have the sort of like replayability as we went. So um, sometime in the first like two years, we're like, oh, we can't actually write this um, in a way that would represent a new story kind of every time you played it. Um, and that sort of butted us up, up against a um, kind of a really hard design challenge. So for a long time in sort of early access, uh, Adam had put in a bunch of sort of dialogue from Jurassic Park to do, because like, he's a huge fan of it, uh, to do a bunch of tests on how like the conversation system could work. Um, and then once we sort of uh, agreed to be a participant in Apple Arcade, that put even like a further constraint on it because now we had to have these like procedural sentences that don't necessarily know the gender of the people talking um, or like we had to gender dogs for like Japanese. Uh, it was really weird. We had to like sort of squash down all this other stuff on our like story, story hooks. Um, and Overland, if you don't know, um, we don't actually tell you what happened to the world or why you're going west on this um, this road trip. You are sort of creating that story as you go because it's kind of stickier and that was a important piece to this to the design sort of from the beginning. Um, but kind of building that system even like two and a half years in um, and even seeing if it was possible uh, was crazy hard. Um, but we didn't actually do the writing on Overland until last year. Um, because the system and proving it out that it could work took so long. That sounds smart that you, you waited to do the actual writing until, until the systems were in place. I know that a lot of times, uh, when you, when you start writing what you think is the real story too soon and the systems aren't proven out, then the systems change and then the writing itself also has to change. Um, and so, so much of game writing is, is actually rewriting. This is something that I tell people who ask. Me about game writing like what is it like to write a game and it's not you know maybe maybe 20 percent of it generously is like coming up with something new and like 80 percent of it is like revisiting stuff that you've already written trying to make it clearer mm -hmm. players didn't understand what was going well, on and also like as like the game design process it's not like you start at the beginning of a game you're like this is what i'm making La! it's like it's a holistic process. It changes so often from like week to week and month to month to where like a year into it, you're like, oh man, this is not what I started out making, but this is now what I'm making. And yeah, if the writing doesn't sort of follow that design process as it goes, you're making a story for a different project by the time it ships. Yeah, definitely. And I think that um, another, another thing that happens a lot is um, you take your game to a play test and play testers don't understand the game or uh, don't like a certain character. Um, and then, and then you have to adapt the writing to make a character more likable. Um, I don't know if anybody has thoughts on, on that. I definitely do. I... Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> oh yeah. I was just going to say, I, I'm living through that right now, actually, although I can't really talk uh... about it very much, but I can, I can say that like, um, it can be really difficult to know, even like you can have like a really cool idea for a story. And then um, as you're like, as you're like actually writing it out, you start to find all of these problems with it. Um, like these characters are not coming off the way that they're supposed to, especially when you have like, like right now I'm working on a kind of like, uh, it's an action -y game, but it has like a narrative through line for it so we have all of these plot beats that have to happen all of these like encounters that are pre like boss fights and that sort of thing that are pre-planned so we have to like work with those beats being there so if somebody has an issue with like ah oh, it doesn't really feel like it's set up or that this climax is really happening in the right way then we have to like you have to rewrite it so that that actually makes sense because you can't do something else now. Like you've already committed to all of these gameplay concepts that can't change. So the narrative design really has to has to work with like 
the beats that already exist. Um, and sometimes that's like kind of like a gratifying challenge because it's like, okay, we can't like, oh, we could like scrap it all and try something new, which is a, a sin I've committed on some of the projects where I'm the director and I get to create my own problems. But for other people's stuff and especially for stuff that you've already committed to, it's like, I can't, I can't really throw this stuff out. We've got to kind of like work with it uh, with, with what we have. Um, and sometimes that constraint though, I think can lead to nice things because um, nothing's worse than not having any constraints at all. So when you really have to like knuckle down and, and make this happen, um, I'll say that on this, on this game, we had this like relationship between two characters we really wanted to focus on. And then we realized that actually the more compelling relationship was between the protagonist and this villain. So we were like, oh, rather than try and do everything to make this one relationship work when we don't actually have room in the story for it, we should go all in on this other thing because it's gonna make the entire plot line and through line of the story feel more compelling. Um, so that was kind of like discovering like, oh, the most important relationship is something else. Um, yep. And you can't really do that until you actually write it. Like, like Matthew was just saying, you can't do it until you write it out wrong the first way um and get feedback and you're like oh now i have all of these new problems to solve um but you wouldn't know where to begin if you hadn't written that first draft yeah 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 we had a very similar thing where we realized that certain character relationships were more compelling than others on firewatch um where it was like really late in the game like we were really hoping to be pretty locked on story um in fact, I think it was, we only realized it the first time someone outside of the studio played the game from end to end. And we realized that um, basically like the, the players were as interested in Delilah as a character as they were in Henry, right? And the game was sort of written to be about Henry and Delilah as like, you know, I mean, we love the Delilah character obviously, but, but she was sort of like there to draw all this stuff out of Henry, but Henry was not super likable by, by, by design. And I think there was a lot of folks who at the end were like, I want more, like what, I won't go into the mystery, but like, I want Delilah's take on all this. Like, how does Delilah feel about this? And that really wasn't there. Like, and, and mm. you know, um, and so we had to basically restructure the core, like narrative, like, like the mystery beats so that Delilah could be involved and have mm. a relationship to the mystery the entire time, which was just an amazingly difficult um, problem to solve where you, you know, you have to kind of like go back in time, stuck in the like scenes that you have, cause you're not gonna get any new scenes, right? And find ways to establish truths and like, and, and make it all like logically make sense. And it was, yeah, it was like so hard, so frustrating, like days of work and just like, you know, like chasing down alternate pathways, but ultimately um, so worth it. And it was really fun to be like, oh, like what if Delilah, what if, ultimately it was like, what if Delilah could see Brian Goodwin's name on the backpack and now, you know, and like then she could bring it up. There's like things like that. And it's so much more fun to clean up uh, those, those sort of like omissions, <laughs> errors and omissions when they're not yours, I could say, which is why I bring up Firewatch stories. <laughs> but I think that that also uh, brings up another interesting point about kind of like, this is all this is all tied up in in the production process of, of these games as well. And the flexibility that you have is sort of directly uh, influenced by the way your game works. Um, in the case of Firewatch and Eliza, they, they have voice acting and they have voice actors who need to read the lines. Um, so you can't just change the story right up until the end. Um, anytime you change uh, dialogue, you have to get the actor back into a recording studio, record all the lines, engineer them, edit them, put them in the game. And that, that adds a huge wrinkle to being able to um, react in real time or re you know, react f quickly when problems come up. And so for, for me during Eliza, you know, we did all the recording of all the actors in, in sort of a big two or three week block. And then I was um, just editing dialogue for a really, really long time. And um, in order to like solve certain, certain problems in, in that, I, that cropped up that I only realized were in the script after I had recorded them, 
you know, I had to do kind of weird, weird things. I like cut some lines, uh, some like small conversations that I originally recorded just don't happen anymore because they don't make any sense. Um, and then sometimes, you know, did even like even weirder things like tried to like Frankenstein two lines together to make them into a new sentence that wasn't necessarily in the script, but the sentence didn't make sense anymore or whatever. And so, and then, and then going back and updating the text script to make it sound like that, that was what they meant to say um, anyway. So there's a lot of um, difficulty in uh, moving backwards, you know, like past certain points in your, in your project, uh, you have to just say, that's it. That's, that's what you have. And I think it's interesting to, to think about like when, when that point is like, um, like at, at what point do you, do you decide, yes, this really is a problem and we really need to rethink all of this versus like, well, it's kind of a subjective thing. Um, you know, let's just, let's just let it be the way it is because at some point you also have to do that as well. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on, on that. I have a throw off comment on that. I think our <laughs> answer will be very different from anyone in AAA. <laughs> To be sure. Fair. Yeah. Uh, I think we'll change it right up until like we hit go on the steam build. Um, just cause I know how indies work. We'll just be like, we're just going to keep fiddling with it until the very last minute. Um, for most of our projects, it's, um, just because of any sort of translation stuff. Um, it has to be done a little bit early. Um, uh, so we might fiddle with it, you know, maybe even up to like two or three weeks before, so long as it doesn't touch code, like before launch. Like uh, I remember Night in the Woods, we were still fixing grammatical errors. Like, oh, that's spelled wrong or there's a period missing here. Like we were still editing that just monstrous script right up until yeah. launch. Typos um, are amazing. They, they, oh, uh, horrible. They'll, they'll nev you'll never find all the typos in a <laughs> large game script. You will ship with so many typos, it's, it's crazy. It's one of the most like, especially the not right after Night in the Woods launched. Uh, so we just would get like support emails of like, so the vowels are wrong in this one. I was like, and we would just like, as soon as we got them in, we would just run in and and fix it. So like the next update would just have those running grammatical errors fixed. Um, some of them were intentional misspellings, um, and yeah, those tripped up a lot of people. And I mean, we got tons of support emails about intentional misspellings. Um, a thing that I wanted to bring up, actually, because you guys were talking about sort of um, VO, um, and what I think is really interesting, so Night in the Woods didn't have VO, obviously, but it did have, um, so obviously, like, Scott and Bethany had to rewrite that script, I mean, just over and over and over and over, which you can sort of tell by how, like, witty and quick and fast it is, um, but the piece that was, like, really hard and interesting was... Um, they use this term blocking when they built the scenes in Unity, which was like sort of blocking May across the screen and all the other characters um, to match up with the conversation. So it's sort of like um, blocking is like a like a film and TV production term, um, which I thought was really, really interesting because like as they honed the script, they would like put in the like they put versions of it in and then realize where it was slow, um, but in the process of blocking, um, which I thought was like. Um, just as like somebody who sort of works in like technology and like seeing that process sort of um, put down on the game, I thought was really interesting um, because also it meant that the script had to be done pretty early. Like the initial blocking and the way the characters move around, not much could change except like the sentence structure or the sort of thing they said. We, it was very difficult to add more. Um, or take away things um, once that was all blocked out and how the scene should move through. Um, and that was actually pretty early. Um, they wouldn't even block a scene unless they had a final script, um, which was how when we went to launch, we knew what we would cut from the game is stuff that wasn't blocked got cut because it wasn't important mm -hmm. enough for us to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that actually really um, that dovetails with a with a question that's that's in the chat right now, because I'm looking at the chat. Um, to what state do you try to have the writing done during pre-production? Uh, do you have a synopsis for the entire game? How specific is it? I think, in my experience, this really depends on the game. Um, in the case of Eliza, because it was a visual novel and I knew it was going to be a visual novel, I did a ton of writing just up front. I was working on the script. Uh, 
pretty much since I got the idea. So for years, it was this side project where I was just kind of writing and writing. Then putting it into visual novel form, there wasn't a ton of like, oh no, it's like it's not going to work moments because I knew that, that the form of the visual novel is a very set form. It's got a set grammar to it. You know, you like it's a it's a well established kind of um, framework to tell a story in. So most of the things that I that I wrote kind of uh, ended up in the game, uh, pretty much how I how I wrote them. But I think in a lot of other uh, games, think the the story isn't written at all at the beginning. Um, maybe one of you can speak to a, a situation like that. Um, I think I can go. Um, yeah, sure. 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 Um, yeah, NeoCab as a visual novel also kind of had that approach where we um, we started writing as soon as we knew the conceit of like you're a driver, uh, you will have passenger conversations. We knew we want we could then rev on how do we break up our texts? Are we first person, third person? How do we use narration? What is the voice of the character, et cetera? And we the only way to do that was through writing rides. Um, and we did it in like a very cheap and easy like web-based prototype that we could actually uh, run people through. And almost every one of those rides was cut, but it was uh, so useful to help us like feel that stuff out and like know that we had a basic unit of content first. So that was, you know, that was really useful. Um, the only downside was we also realized kind of then in the middle of, in the middle of like the early stage of production, like, okay, we do want to tell a frame story here. We don't just want it to be like an anthology of little moments. Like we think the game could work that way, but like we think it'll be better if there's a frame story. And that was cool. But then suddenly we realized like, oh shoot, we like have a character budget of like maybe 18 characters. And now, and like some of our early characters who we wrote just because we fell in love with this like moment um now i have to do double duty they have to like both be fun and charming and weird and like a surprising thing and like drop a core clue or be a uh, unlocking force like in the late game so yeah it just it definitely like led to a lot of like puzzly logic where something some characters are in the game in a more central way than if we had been able to like right from scratch but but ultimately i don't know i feel like that adds texture and quirk quirks to the game that i ultimately really enjoy yeah i would say it totally it totally depends on the on the game it depends on who's making the game um it depends on on if the person or the team making the game has a real vision for where the story is going to go right at the beginning or or if they don't i mean there's so many different kinds of games and so many different approaches that uh that end up working so uh, like a lot of game development, you can you can do it in lots of different different ways. Uh, and the more games you make, I think the more the more ways you'll see it being done. Um, that brings me to another uh, thing that would I think would be interesting for us to talk about, which is the teamwork aspect. Um, Av, you you mentioned that before on your on your games on your visual novels, you were the director, and so you could do whatever you wanted with them. But now you're working with this um, another team that's making the game and you're doing the writing and, and going back and forth with them on it. Um, what, are, what are some of the challenges of that kind of, uh, that kind of work? And Patrick and Becca, I know you, you both uh, work with external teams and, or external writers and stuff like that. So I think we all have something to say about this. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk to talk about there, especially since, you know, even when I was the director, um, you know, like half of the story and characterization was coming from my artist, Mia Schwartz. So we were kind of like co-creating almost everything about the world. Um, like, I think the writer artist relationship is often really, really important, especially, I mean, especially on a smaller team, but you're kind of like both setting not just the the narrative but the aesthetic presence of what's happening um thinking a little bit about like the process for making games that you were talking about earlier uh christine love told me once um that she like designs the ui first that's like the first thing she does because that's like how the player is going to interface with and look at the game she that's has so an scary. idea of like 
plot and, and, and setting and that sort of thing as well. But she was like, here's the UI. This is what people are going to look at, especially for like a lot of her visual novels. It's like, that's most of how you, how you process the whole game. Um, but yeah, it's very different. Like as a director, I kind of like, like I said, create my own problems. It's like, here's the, here are the ideas at play. Um, here's the sort of stuff that I want to focus on when somebody else is doing that. There's a lot of interpretation involved. You know, you're trying to like, you're trying to be like, okay, you want characters that do these things, um, that have these sorts of moments. Now it's my job to figure out how to like write a moment in which that comes off. Um, and a lot of times through that process, you find that you're not necessarily on the exact same page or you have different ideas of like how to convey X thing or Y like personality trait. Um, and characters maybe come off like a bit different than they had intended. And oftentimes I think that's like, that that can be like a really good thing. And sometimes like you're able to take characters and, and, and concepts in directions that neither of you had anticipated, um, but end up feeling feeling a lot more right and correct. And other times there's like more work where it's like, I, 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 I've been doing this lately in which I have like, you know, there are certain directions that I kind of like take the story because it's no what I know how to write. Um, like I can like joke around a lot. Like I, 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 it's easier for me to write kind of like comedic moments um, with certain kinds of characters. So kind of like knowing to pull back off of that if like it's kind of like changed a little bit too much of how the script feels um, depending on like the sort of moments that we want to convey. Um, so there's a definite like, there's a definite process where it's like the whole script is going to change and get rewritten so often because like everything else in game design, it's a whole bunch of people communicating um, with each other and you don't necessarily know how to like do the things. You're just like, you're taking your will and you're like going, uh, you're like, this is my idea of how to make this happen. Um, and there's both like really wonderful creativity that comes with that. And then also like, uh, a kind of like reining in process that ha that has to happen as well. This actually brings up a really interesting thing. We've been talking about a bunch lately because we have at Finji, because we're finishing up sort of Overland 1.2 right now, um, we have started um, kind of the design process of like, what are we gonna do next? Um, and we sort of have a internal policy of um, experts. So we kind of like have siloed experts. So we have audio like on staff, we have art on staff, we have programming on staff, and everybody kind of like um, as our leads, those are all part of the design and creative process. Um, we currently don't have a narrative designer, but it's something we're actually looking at for sort of our next pro project because of the type of game that we think we might want to do. Um, and I think it's really interesting that oftentimes, a lot like audio, writing is sort of like this thing that you sort of push on top. So it's almost like fighting against the design that's already set, um, which is like completely the opposite of how in general, like Finji and almost all the Finji games that we've decided to publish, uh, writing is something that is brought up from the ground up with the design. Um, like Scott Benson, wrote Night in the Woods, but he's also the, you know, lead artist and animator. Um, the Chicory team, like, uh, I can't actually remember who's writing Chicory. Oh, she have written it down before I got on the call. Um, but that's like coming up right at the beginning of Chicory as well. Um, and even like Overland, like Adam and I wrote that together. Um, like, and we obviously were from the beginning from Overland. Um, and I think it's really interesting, like, when you have people who are coming onto a project so early, you're able to grow that project together and rely on your experts. So when design has an issue, they should be coming to the narrative designer and been like, how can we solve this together? Because you'll end up with a better solution that doesn't feel weird at the end of it. Um, and I kind of wish, like, especially with writing and audio, like we've always brought on audio, like at the very basement level of a project because they're in charge of the mood of the whole game. and writing they're in charge of how you care about these characters um and those things have like so much to do with how your like empathetic relationship with like future player like how they're going to experience this thing that you've created um and i think it's it's fascinating especially if you come from like two different points of like sort of from the ground up and also coming onto a project yeah. like and feeling that tension that's there depending on the type of project you're engaging with 
Yeah, it creates a really different experience sometimes. I wouldn't necessarily say if it's like, uh, it like, it's not necessarily better or worse, but it is really different, especially when you're dealing with a lot of stuff that's already been committed to, then your problem solving is really focused on like, how can I, um, how can I like take what I'm good at and what this game is good at and like find a way for us for those to meet like because you can't change the game to be mm-hmm. more like oh if the plot is more has more of these things that I'm good at then then I get to do this sort of stuff if not you have to like really like push yourself to learn new skills but also like take what you're given and kind of like find find like the unity between the two that's the kind of like challenge more than like creating something from the ground up where you're trying to create keep these things in harmony it's more like reconciling to two different uh, mm-hmm. forces yeah for my for my part i think working on eliza was really interesting because i did the writing uh the voiceover direction and i, I got to do the music as well which is a little bit unusual so i, I get to i got to write my own music to underscore these conversations which was really cool. I, I knew exactly what I wanted for, for each of those things. Um, but the art, you know, wasn't me, I, I can't draw. And so working with the artists was uh, a really great process where it was kind of like, I would tell them who I thought these characters were, what, what I thought their traits were, they would start developing some sketches. And it's just a real joy actually to see them uh, interpret these characters because they aren't just doing what you say, you're, you know, you're not like, oh, draw, draw this. You're like, here's who I think this person is. And then they interpret that and they add onto it. You know, they, 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 they come up with their own details like, oh, this character, you know, if I described someone as like this, this person is very, um, takes themselves very seriously, then they might draw someone, you know, wearing a kind of out, a certain outfit or like having their hair in a certain way. Something that I never thought of when I wrote the character because I just I wrote the description things that, that I were thinking that I was thinking of. So the artists uh, add information. The actors also bring their own interpretation and and their performance adds information. So honestly, like the teamwork aspect for me, as long as as long as it it goes well, it can be really really cool to see this thing come come to life with contributions from from multiple from multiple people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's another question in in chat. Do you guys have trouble when conveying a character's voice through text, like tone of voice, manner of speaking, preference in word use? This is a kind of a very nuts and bolts mm-hmm. question. Uh, I have, so ours had to be for Overland pretty generic, but I um, talked a little bit a couple of years ago about this to Scott. Um, so Scott and Bethany wrote it together, but the words for the most part, almost entirely in Night in the Woods is Scott. There are a few places um, where you can see other people wrote because we needed text in that scene. It was sort of like a side scene. And some of the other collaborators actually did the, the um, writing on, on those uh, particular parts. Um, but it was interesting talking to Scott uh, about this because when you initially write something, um, kind of your after your first read through, you see that a lot of the tone has been blended all together. And then you really have to on second and third and fourth and 30th drafts, um, hone down on the way people's cadence even works in written form, which is like yeah. an art form, like even in books, you have to do yeah. this. Um, it's not any different than video game, except it's like all dialogue. Like there's no description we can't rely on. Like you can see the stuff on screen, but you can't, um, you know, there's no like she asked angrily, like maybe she's got like, you know, a, a decent facial expression, but even that's not possible. And especially some of the indie games because they're so low poly or abstract. Um, it all has to be communicated in um, tone. Um, yeah, that was, that was big, pretty much exactly my answer too, which is that, the first time I write it, it sounds like just me saying it. And then, <laughs> you know, you have to go back and kind of pull pull out like, okay, this character would say that, but they would say it in this way. And then you just kind of refine it. And then you pull your characters away from each other and give them their unique, uh, their unique speech patterns. But at the first, in the first draft, you're just kind of working out like what the actual content of the of the conversation is and what the scene needs to do and where it needs to go. Then you go back and you and you add all the all the kind of the fun um, mannerisms of the person saying, saying things. Yeah, we, because we had a large writer's room and 
you know, we, we wanted to have a lot of different voices on the project because so it would feel like a city, you know, so people would could get in and, you know, like have a very different personality and um, just convey that sense of like anyone could get into the car right now. Um, we, we had all these different writers, but it definitely me meant that we had to figure out um, how to make the game feel consistent, uh, like really early on. So Paula Rogers, who's our uh, managing editor, um, was really helpful in that way. Like she managed to get a, a story Bible for like every character. And we also like had endless like discussions slash arguments about the, you know, like our like style guide. So it would be like, you know, like how do we, like literally, I think we've we probably have talked of the lifetime of the project like for five hours on ellipses alone about where you know when to use them, what counts as overusing them, do we capitalize after them, like all of that stuff. So this yeah, for us like story bibles, style guide, and then having like other cues for for emotion um, were all like really key to telling a story where characters felt distinct even though it was you know we had no VO. I'll say, I feel like I'm really bad at this, but um, the uh, artists are there to save my ass. Uh, so, like, I feel like there, this is, like, where that relationship, like, really, really comes in um, on, like, especially on, like, uh, the visual novels that I, like, directed where I was, like, really, like, working really closely with an artist on creating all of the characters and everything that they did. Um, having somebody to bounce off of and 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 to say like this character feels like she does this she like acts in this this is her favorite music this is her favorite like in this situation she would do this um that sort of like character dynamic stuff um was really really helpful to have and to have somebody else who was like really invested in defining those characters um through a different medium so like i didn't have any other writers that I was working on, but the writer artist relationship or, or depending on who else you're you're working with really can help um, kind of like create those distinct, have an idea of like creating these distinctive voices the more that you understand them as, as separate characters. Um, I tend to not be a super big believer in like kind of like giving people like real like quirky ways of like distinguishing between them. Cause I think that sometimes, sometimes it can work, sometimes it can be annoying. Um, we had certain like rules for like, there are characters who like text each other, they talk to each other and they text each other. So the texting conversations are written completely differently and with a different eye to like how this character communicates in written communication versus verbal communication. Um, so that was like, so there are fun opportunities for, for, um, for communicate for like distinguishing the characters there. Um, but even the fact, it's like amazing how much I feel like it changes it for the reader, but also for myself when I see a picture of the character. Um, and I really try and have that like super early on. Um, even just a sketch or a rough draft, even if their character design changes like really substantially, um, I think it's I think it's really crucial to have that. Um, whatever, like, however your character is getting representate, represented, whether it's like visually or mechanically, you really need to have that to kind of like have somebody else start defining a character with you. That's, that's at least, especially for big collaborative things like games. Yeah, for sure. Um, Eliza has, in addition to its voice lines, um, Eliza has I am conversations as well. And I came up with a little mini style guide for how the different characters I am, how they behave, right? So one of the characters, Nora, is the person who sends like, 10 three word texts like she just continues the sentence like in the next line of the text so you get like 10 dings for her to say one thing and then another one of the characters you know spends spends a really long time and then just a whole paragraph comes in right and then um rainer one of the other guys uses periods and and uses punctuation in his ims which is makes him sound is he mad at me? you know there's just like different <laughs> <laughs> there's different there's different things you can do you know to just vary it uh vary it up uh even yeah. even only we, in, when you're working only in text we we spent like an embarrassing amount of engineering time getting it so we could time out like i'm typing to you wait no i deleted it no i'm typing to you no wait, i deleted it because that's like that feeling right is so 
I'm sure all of you found the same thing, right? That that feeling is so like pregnant with, oh my God, it was supposed to be this way to me. Yeah. yeah, the other person that's typing animation is so key. Yeah. Like Becca was talking about, I feel like if there's one thing I wish I, I could spend a whole panel on talking about, it's blocking. Because like we don't, I feel like a lot of narrative design conversations are like, oh, you write it. But it's like, I have also like, I, like for the things that I've directed, I wrote out the whole script and had the artist come in and, and start doing expressions. And then I went through and I tagged every expression in the script and like had to like, and figure out if those expressions made sense, if they worked, um, you know, like delaying when a line starts, like like having the ellipses go dot, dot, dot. Like when somebody is talking to like show a pro pause, there's so much technology and there's so much stuff you can do. Um, on the current project, there's somebody else whose job is just doing that. So um, I kind of am like giving directions and ideas and that person is like contributing a lot of stuff. But but in prior projects, it's been a mishmash of, you know, we don't have like, I, I work on like, we had like four full-time members and two contractors. So it's really small teams. So that means like everyone is pitching in and there are various ways to do, to do, do this sort of stuff. This was actually a huge problem um, specifically with Night in the Woods because the team was so small. Um, and that's actually where Yarn Spinner, like the text engine came from um, oh, because yeah. Scott needed the ability to animate all of his characters um, basically by the text popping across the screen. So part of the reason why Night in the Woods has been so terrifying when it comes to translations and why kind of we only have the Japanese one, um, Yarn Spinner is full of like, like quite literally emoji basically. And those trigger all the animations um, because then Scott, as he was blocking and like the text was popping up, he was able to control like all 9 billion animations of all these characters. Um, like, I mean, May's got some like 50 or something just with her face, like with her ears moving and her eyes. And like, it's so important. Like if you are also creative director and the writer, and the animator and the artist having these robust tools to be able to go in and like quickly control that sort of stuff. But also as a narrative designer, like if somebody's like grimacing or like frowning or like rolling their eyes, how do you mark that in text? And how many people is it going to get lost through like in the production scale? And like it, the eye roll might matter. It may change the entire meaning of that sentence and what happened. For sure. Well, I feel like, um... We could probably talk about this for hours uh, to come, but we've got to start wrapping it up now. So uh, thank you all for being on this amazing panel. Um, let us know where you can can find you on the internet. All right, I'll go first. Uh, cool. <laughs> all right. <no. laughs> uh, I'm easy to find. Uh, it's uh, at Finji Co. F I N J I C O or my personal, which is just like my trash feed, which is B-E-X-S-A-L-T-S-M-A-N um, on the Twitters. Cool. Yeah, um, Neocab is at Neocab Game on Twitter, Insta, Book, and I am at Hoverbird on most of those things. And yeah, give me a holler. Tell me what you think about Neocab, which is, oh yeah, which is on Apple Arcade, Nintendo Switch, and Steam. Check it out. Um, and yeah, you can find me at Mammon Machine, M-A-M-M-O-N Machine, and you can find uh, um, you can find my games. Uh, we're, uh, uh, Heaven will be mine, and we know the devil. They're both on Steam, um, and I I can't talk about the new thing yet, but look forward to it. I guess <laughs> it's gonna be it'll be quite good. I am really excited to eventually get to talk about it. Um, I think that was everything. Awesome. And I'm Matthew Seiji, um, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-S-E-I-J-I on Twitter and on the web. And Eliza is a visual novel about um, AI and therapy, and it's available for Mac and PC on Steam, and it's also on Nintendo Switch. So yeah, thank you everyone for um, for being here with us and joining us on the storytelling setbacks and how to navigate them panel. I don't know if this is gonna automatically end or what, or if we just kind of sit here and like wait. Thanks for moderating. <laughs> oh yeah, no problem. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>